Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to a very compelling conversation we're about to have with Professor Thomas Healy. He's a professor of law at Seton Hall University Law School and the author of this book. The book is called Race, Equality, and the Lost Dream of an American Utopia. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you. Set this up, uh, Soul City. Soul City was set up in what year in North Carolina? It was launched in 1969 uh, on a former slave plantation in rural North Carolina, about an hour north of Raleigh-Durham. And the whole idea was to create a community that was disproportionately there to support the African-American community, to be run by those who are African-American, to support economic opportunity uh, for those who are Hispanic, and got funding from the federal government during the Nixon administration, if I'm not mistaken, right? Absolutely, and, and your description is is, uh, is is accurate. It was designed to be a model of black economic empowerment. The idea was that uh, African Americans could only have political equality and political independence if they had economic equality and economic independence. So the idea was to create a community uh, where the levers of power would be in the hands of black people and capital would be in the hands of black people. And yes, you're right, it, it was supported by the Nixon administration, which was a kind of odd alliance. Sure. Why did it fail? Failed for a number of reasons. I mean, they were attempting to build a city from scratch in the middle of uh, rural North Carolina out of really nothing but but red dirt. Um, they had to they had to bring in everything they needed. They had to bring in the infrastructure. They had to build um, homes in the community. There was uh, no running water. There are a whole range of people that did not have functioning toilets, if you will. Why that location, though? Well, the location had some real advantages. First of all, land was very cheap, and and he, uh, the the developer of Soul City, a man named Floyd McKissick, he needed about five thousand acres of land, and he knew he could get it relatively cheaply there. Uh, labor was also cheap, which would be an enticement for industry to come in and build factories there. Um, it was halfway between Raleigh, Durham, and Richmond. It was a part of what's known as the Piedmont Industrial Corridor. Uh, it was adjacent to. Um, a major highway, Interstate I-85. It wasn't far from Interstate uh, 95. And there was a, a railroad that ran right by the property that, uh, that they could use for shipping goods to and from the community. So there were some real obstacles, but there were some real advantages to this site. It's so interesting. People often say, you know, and, and you write about this extensively in Seoul City, that it, quote, failed. Okay, we could say it failed, but there were lessons to be learned from this, this because economic empowerment in the black community remains a critically important theme and challenge. So it failed, yes, but we learned what? Well, I mean, one thing we learned is just what you said, that this is the unfinished business of the struggle for black freedom and the civil rights movement, uh, economic equality. You know, the racial wealth gap uh, is about the same today as it was in 1969 when Floyd McKissick launched this effort. Uh, and by the way, Floyd McKissick um, led this effort, a lawyer by training? A lawyer by training. He was one of the major figures of the civil rights movement. He headed a group. Tied to Dr. King? He was very close. That they they worked together on lots of on lots of initiatives and projects. They led the 1966 March Against Fear together. Right. Um, and and Floyd McKissick, this was this was his vision, his brainchild. Um, and what he recognized was that the civil rights movement had made a lot of progress. Um, lots of important legislation was passed, and and lots of important cases were won. But the one thing that was not completed was giving. African Americans economic independence and economic equality. And, and that's really the unfinished business today. And that's why the the inability of Soul City to reach its its goals, um, I think is so disappointing and so frustrating. And, and I think one of the lessons that we can draw from it um, is that that's something that we need to invest in. And we need to, when when people like Floyd McKissick explain what it is that black people need and what they're trying to accomplish, I think we need to do a better job of listening to that. Real quick, uh, why did and why do you care so much about this? Well, I care about it in part because I'm from North Carolina. Um, there was a newspaper that played a big role in uh, in essentially killing Soul City that I worked for as a young journalist out of college. So I have a kind of personal connection to it, um, but also as a, as a law professor, as 
Uh, I teach constitutional law. I think a lot about equality. Um, you know, this 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 is a part of uh, our larger history and trying to um, understand the forces that have that have thwarted racial equality is is really important as for anyone who who cares about uh, who cares about our democracy. Two things. One, this book is being turned into a documentary. Two, let's not, let us not forget that uh, Senator Jesse Helms, uh, Google Senator Jesse Helms, folks, he's extensively written about in this book, North Carolina United States Senator, segregationist, um, by most reasonable standards, a racist in the United States Senate, absolutely dead set against Soul City and wanted it to fail and worked actively for its failure. Correct. Yes, yes, absolutely. And made clear from the very beginning uh, that he was going to try to kill Soul City. In fact, uh, when Floyd McKissick reached out to Jesse Helms in 1972, after Helms was elected to the Senate, uh, Jesse Helms responded and said, essentially, I'm going to do everything I can in my power to kill Soul City. Um, and he did. And, and that's an important part of the story. However, another part of the story is that it wasn't just racists like Jesse Helms that opposed Soul City. A lot of white integrationists opposed Soul City because they didn't understand what he was trying to do. Um, they were saying, let's be together. Let's, what are you doing creating? I'm sorry for, again, the book fascinated me so much. It's not my job to, to describe this, but they didn't like, like the idea of separating. It was like, let's push for integration. That's what all these civil law, rights of laws are about. But this was about economic opportunity and not just integrating schools and communities, right? Absolutely. And, and it was not going to be separatist. It was a multiracial uh, project. A quarter of his staff was white, his closest friend and advisor. McKissick. On the project who, who lived, yeah, McKissick's closest friend and advisor on the project was white. He made clear from the beginning that this community was going to be open to all, but that the primary goal was to benefit uh, Black people, especially the poor and the unemployed. The book is Soul City, Race, Equality, and the Lost Dream of an American Utopia. Thomas Healy from, the, from Seton Hall University Law School is the author. Um, Professor, thank you so much for joining us, and I encourage everyone to check this book out. It's an important part. We've been part of a, an ongoing series called Confronting Racism. This is, this book is a piece of a much larger complex mosaic. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Bank of America, Atlantic Health System, the Russell Berry Foundation, PSCNG, the New Jersey Education Association, the Northward Center, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Delta Dental of New Jersey, and by N.J. Best. New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by NJ Biz. How do you create change? By cultivating hope. And we see that every day. In the eyes of our preschoolers, in the souls of the seniors in our adult day program, in the minds of the students at Robert Treat Academy, a national blue ribbon school of excellence, in the passion of children in our youth leadership development program, in our commitment to connections at the Center for Autism, and in the heart of our community, the North Ward Center, creating opportunities for equity, education, and growth.